Yes, we are beginning Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. We began the book of Acts about 14 months ago. Here we are in chapter 9. Who thought we would ever get to chapter 9 this quick? <laughs> chapter 8 was all about the ministry of Philip. Philip, you remember, is one of the seven chosen in Acts chapter 6 to address the Hellenistic widows that were being neglected at the table. But chapter 8 was all about the ministry of Philip. And he must have been a remarkable man, an evangelist. Remarkable man. He led the new mission to the Samaritans. God then sent him to a more far-reaching ministry breakthrough to witness to an Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch. Philip's witness to this man may be considered the first conversion of a Gentile in the church age. That's the significance of it. And here is what the Lord did. He prepared someone. He made them ready to go. That would be the man Philip. He had been preaching to the Samaritans. He had been proclaiming, no doubt, the Old Testament scriptures. Those were the only scriptures that he had access to. The New Testament had not been written by that time. So as he proclaimed the scriptures, he proclaimed what the scriptures said about Jesus Christ and very, very likely addressed Isaiah 53 and talking about him. So the Lord prepared someone. He made someone ready to go. Just as you and I are prepared week by week, made ready to go, the things that we learn here in the first and second hour of our study of the Word of God is not merely to bring comfort to us, it's true, but it is to equip us and prepare us to go and share the Word with others, to be the light, to be the bright light that we are, to be the testimony of Christ's grace that we should be. So what the Lord did is He prepared someone. He also calls the reception. That is, He made someone ready to hear. And that was this Ethiopian man who was visiting Jerusalem to worship God. A God-fearer, likely. And if he was a true eunuch, he was not allowed to go anywhere other than the court of the Gentiles so his worship ability was limited as far as location at the temple. But he was puzzled about the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53 and verses 7 and 8. And we can probably base our, his confusion on the, on the very likelihood that he did not find any help with Isaiah 53 from the rabbis in Jerusalem. Since they rejected the one that the 50, Isaiah 53 spoke of, then they did not know its true meaning either. So the Lord prepared someone and told him to go south, and then at the same time, he was making someone ready to hear. He was prompting the heart. He had been for a while, and he brings these two together. And what did he do? He gave a powerful scripture to that person. No doubt Philip had already preached this passage and the Ethiopian was mulling over and musing about the true meaning. This servant, who does it speak of, Israel or someone else? God did all of this. He prepared someone. He calls the reception. He gave a powerful scripture. Scripture is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Scripture has the ability, according to Hebrews 4.12, to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You can say a lot of things to people, but when you start sharing the word of God with them, it has the ability to cut through to the very heart, the mission control center of that person, and open up their motives and open up their thoughts, allows them to see themselves for who they really are, to see themselves as God sees them. So a powerful scripture was given, and it result, God caused a personal salvation of this man. He prepared, he, he caused a reception, he gave a powerful scripture, and he caused a personal salvation to this man, this Ethiopian. We do not know anything more about him. For sure, he went back home, ministered to the, the, the Candace that was in power at that time, but we don't know 
Through church history, there is very little, maybe a sentence or two that is ever mentioned about him. However, we do know that Christianity was very strong in North Africa in the early years. In the first three, four, five hundred years, Christianity was very strong and very prominent in North Africa. And then later around seven and eight hundred um, A.D., Islam began to take over those areas. So he calls the personal salvation. Now salvation is a word that can apply to physical deliverance and spiritual deliverance. There is no unique word that means spiritual deliverance. Saved. There is, there, there is no unique word that means physical deliverance only. So the same word is used. So it can apply to both things. And the context will indicate which one is meant. And there are many synonyms for salvation, for that, that result, that act of salvation. Scripture uses the terms born again, belief, repentance, confession, reconciliation, receiving. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 14, the text says, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, that is, they were saved. So scripture uses as a synonym for salvation, receiving, acceptance. First Thess 2.13, acceptance is a term that's used. But there is much confusion these days about what it means to be saved and where one can find salvation. Some people would think that all roads lead to heaven as so long as you're sincere, as long as you're sincere about your faith and it will eventually lead you to heaven. That's not true. All roads do not lead to heaven. There is one road and Jesus himself characterized that road as narrow and few there are that are on that road. It's important to know these things. Well, let me ask you a question. Is it important to know these things? Well, only if you're concerned about where you will spend eternity. You mean reincarnation is not true? No, reincarnation is not true. Nor do we simply fizzle out into nothingness when we die. People have been created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. That means there is a spiritual and physical part of us that will exist forever. Well beyond the grave. And clarity about salvation merits our strongest attention. Everyone should be clear about what constitutes true salvation. We need to know it for ourselves so that we can be uh, secure about our own salvation. We need to know it so that we can tell others how to be saved. Since many who claim to follow Jesus Christ do not, and they really don't know what the scriptures say about a relationship with Jesus Christ is and what it looks like. Striking examples of conversion are fascinating to read. Have you read about John Newton? Remember John Newton? He wrote Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. Did you know that John Newton was once a slave trader? Once a slave himself? Once he was the captain of his own slave ship? Could a more striking example of conversion than Saul of Tarsus be found anywhere? We have come to chapter 9, widely known as the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. This is the first of three accounts that are in the book of Acts that Luke records. The first here in chapter 9 is given in third person. In other words, Luke is telling the story using third person. He did this and then... Then Saul went over and found this man. That, those kind of terms. The second time is in, for, given in first person. I, Paul would use, I did this and I was struck. And he spoke this to his Jewish unbelieving brethren in defense of his ministry in Acts chapter 22. And the third time it is given is also in first person. And it's given as his personal testimony to King Agrippa to Festus and to Bernice in Acts chapter 26, verses 1 through 23. The, the repetition, as we would likely suspect, and it's true, the repetition speaks to the importance of this event. It's important to Luke that he record this three different times so that people, the readers would be convinced of this man who made such a transformation from murdering the people who 
are part of the way. And from going from that point to preaching the message that he once tried to destroy, what can account for such a change in a man? Answer, nothing but the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it's recorded three times. Of course, in the context here, Paul needed to make a defense of himself. Luke didn't have to include it. There's many things that happened that Luke did not include in the early years of the church. But these, this conversion of Saul, he did three times. So the repetition speaks to its, its vital importance to be in Scripture. Chapter 8 closed noting the faithfulness of Philip and then he disappears abruptly from the story and Saul reappears with equal suddenness. The first time we heard of Saul was the very, very end of chapter 7 as those who were stoning Stephen, they laid their coats in his care. He approved, he watched this happen and then in chapter 8 and verse 1, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death and on that day, great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. Now Saul, Saul dropped off the scene. Luke picked up the missionary expansion of Philip into Samaria, into the coastal towns, as I showed you on the map. And now he's picking up with this conversion of Saul. He's going to leave Saul after the first 19 verses, or excuse me, after the first... Um, 30 verses or so, he's going to pick back up in verse 32 with Peter's ministry, follow Peter all the way through chapter 10, and then we're going to pick up Saul again. It's going to be in chapter 12 and 13. So, Peter, so Luke is giving the record of the first 30 years of the history of the church. He's explained the expansion of the gospel to Samaria and to the west a little, and we're going to find out today in the conversion of Saul that the church had already expanded even to Damascus. Even to Damascus. It had gone north, northeast at this point, by this time. When is this taking place? 34, 35 A.D. 34 to 35 A.D. It's about four to five years since Pentecost has happened. That's the time frame we're looking at from Pentecost to the conversion of Paul. Somewhere in that area, four to five years. And this salvation act by God was no different than the salvation of any other person. Salvation is a miracle. Every one of them is a miracle. As he takes a person condemned and in a state he cannot free himself from it takes God's supernatural ability to take him out of that state of condemnation and place him into a state of being a beloved son a beloved child that's nothing less than a miracle every every salvation is a miracle what is different about the salvation of Saul is the impact that he had in the world many regard his conversion as the most important event in the history of the church since Pentecost, and it's a good argument. Critics ask for proof of Christianity, and we would be quite responsible to point them to this man, Saul of Tarsus. If this militant adversary of Jesus Christ was truly converted to become Christianity's most zealous supporter, it demands an explanation. And we have it three times. One writer, F.F. F. Bruce, he wrote this, no single event apart from the Christ event itself has proved so determinant for the course of Christian history as the conversion and commissioning of Paul. Why would Saul leave his tradition, his worldview, his authority, his connections, his friends, and then endure the terrible sufferings that he went through unless he was convinced that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. It's the only explanation. Before this happened, he regarded Jesus Christ as one accursed, right? Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, correct? That's his thought. This cannot be the Messiah. He was hung on a tree. Scripture says everyone who's hung on a tree is cursed. This cannot be Messiah. That's his thought.
F.F. F. Bruce, again, he says, attempts to account for Paul's experience in uh, physiological or psychological terms are precarious and inadequate to boot unless they take adequately into consideration the fact that it involved the intelligent and deliberate surrender of his will to the risen Christ who had appeared to him. The risen Christ who from this time on displaced the law as the center of his life and thought. The Mosaic law had preeminence in his thinking and it was shattered. When this bright light appeared to him, knocked him off his feet, the law as he understood it was just shattered to pieces. It's like um, you picture... You picture seeing an explosion, things just go in every direction in pieces. Now imagine it all coming back and looking different. And that's what happened to Saul. And when it came back, it was different and it clicked. He was born again and everything changed. So let's read verse 1 through the first part of verse 19 in chapter 9. Follow along in your Bibles. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was there, he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. To bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized And he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. And you can see in verse 20, immediately he began to proclaim Jesus Christ. This section that we've read, verses 1 through 19, is about the election of Saul by the Lord Jesus as an instrument of evangelization. There are many things that happened here, but the main message and the point is the election of Saul as an instrument of evangelization. And we could outline the section like this. Verses 1 and 2 is the expedition to Damascus. In verses 3 through 9, meeting Jesus on the Damascus road. Verses 10 through 16, you have the commission of Ananias. And verses 17 through the first part of verse 19, evidence of Saul's conversion. We're only going to get through the first two verses this morning. There's a lot here about the Apostle Paul. It's fascinating. So many books have been written about him. 
And I wish, in some degree, to some extent, I wish I had started reading these books knowing this was coming three months ago, and then we would be in verses one and two for two or three weeks. There is a similarity here with chapter eight where God worked in Philip and the Ethiopian at the same time to bring about his plan. And we see here in chapter nine, God working in Saul and Ananias at the same time to bring about his plan. We're gonna see that very thing in Acts chapter 10 where you're going to see God working on Peter and Cornelius at the same time, bringing them together to accomplish his plan. And it ought to be a great encouragement to you as the Lord puts it into your heart and you know that we need to share the truth with people, share the gospel with people, know that the Lord is working on someone else out there who needs to hear the truth. It's not cold turkey, so to speak. God is working, preparing, almost just guiding every step. He's going to bring that person to you that needs to hear the gospel. So be confident and be assured that your Lord is working on many other fronts at the same time. Our responsibility is not all the other fronts. Our responsibility is me, I. Be faithful, I. Be faithful, the Lord will take care of everybody else. So be encouraged by that. Up to this point, we have allotted very little time to an inventory of Saul's life, so we should do that here. We know that Saul was young. Uh, Chapter seven and verse, the latter two or three verses in chapter seven has told us that he was young. But we also noted there that that word young has a range of age, so it doesn't help us a great deal. That That term that's used young can mean a man up to 40 years old or has been used of men up to 40 years old. So that, that age, that term young doesn't help us a great deal because it has a range of age. The word was applied to boys, to men in the prime of manhood, as we noted, up to 40 years. We do not know whether he was a member of the Sanhedrin, but he definitely exercised some kind of delegated authority in the death of Stephen. Those things we do know, those things the scripture has given to us already. Scripture also tells us in different places, that he was born in Tarsus. Tarsus is a significant Greek city located in Cilicia. Cilicia is a region north of Cyprus. If you look at, uh, sometime look at your maps in the back of your Bible, you'll see the island of Cyprus. You just go directly north and maybe just a little bit to the east and you'll see Cilicia there and you'll, likely you'll see the town of Tarsus there. If you're familiar with well familiar with scripture, you remember a city by the name of Seleucia. That's in Acts 13.4. And you remember from Colossians 4, a city by the, that's called Hierapolis. Colossians 4.13. These are two cities that were located in Cilicia as well. So Saul uh, was in that area, wrote to people in that area. He was not raised in Tarsus, though he was born in Tarsus. He was raised in Jerusalem, and he was educated under Gamaliel. And it's likely that he joined this this rabbi, became his student in his early teens. And Acts chapter 22 and verse 3 tells us his education was strict. He talks about the strictness of his education. And, And what that means is not that he got slapped with the ruler all the time, and there were a lot of rules What it means is precision. The word strict means precision and exactness. And that would explain his actions as a Pharisee, right? A Pharisee, you would would split hairs. They got to the point where they were splitting hairs. That precision and that exactness was woven into his thought process. It was part of who he was. That's the way he was trained. And it was according to the law of his fathers or our fathers, he was zealous, Galatians 14, 1 14 says that he was zealous for those ancestral traditions. So the exactness and the precision that he was taught, he was zealous for those traditions. This is a man who is on fire, wrong path, but still on fire. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee 
Philippians 3.5 tells us, if the study and practice of the law according to the traditional interpretation constituted the way of acceptance by God and a share in the life of the age to come, then Paul's chance of this attainment was a high one. Remember, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. I am innocent, he, he would say in some terms. I am innocent of these things. In regard to the standard of righteousness prescribed by the oral law, he was, on his own later testimony, blameless. He would consider himself blameless. He succeeded at maintaining a good conscience in respect to his duty towards God and towards fellow man. This was, this was a man who was, in, in every sense of the word, Bought, had bought into the Pharisaical understanding of Scripture and the ancestral traditions, and he was following them with everything that he had. Everything that he had. And he felt justified in putting people in prison. Now, he, didn't, he did not murder people, but he cast his vote approving their murder. He was not an executioner. This was Saul of Tarsus. The situation with Stephen gave the Sanhedrin an opportunity to pursue a policy of repression against the way. As you note in chapter 9, verse 2, he asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way... Into this persecution, Saul threw himself zealously. And he went about it with everything that he had. Regarding citizenship, he was born a citizen of Rome, which was a great privilege in the day in which he lived. He was actually born a citizen of Rome, which means that his father or his grandfather was a citizen as well. In Acts 22 and verse 27, each legitimately born child of a Roman citizen had to be registered within the first 30 days of their birth. He was registered. How did people, Saul would appeal to his Roman citizenship? How did people know? I mean, you can, you can imagine that anybody that was about to be scourged or hung on a cross, would appeal, but I'm a Roman citizen. A lot of people potentially may do that. How did people know when they made a claim to Roman citizenship? How did they know they were a citizen? They had, like we do, they had some form of ID tablet that Roman citizens would carry with them. And when, very likely, when Rome, when Paul claimed Roman citizenship, he would show the evidence of him being a Roman citizen. Like, a, like an ID of some sort. Now, how did a Jewish family of Tarsus acquire this exceptional distinction of having Roman citizenship? He didn't buy it. They didn't buy the Roman citizenship. He was, Paul was, uh, Saul was born into it. So how did this family acquire this? Well, the family was an ardent follower of the Jewish way. This much, knowing that, comes through Paul's claim to be a Hebrew of Hebrews in Philippians 3, 5. In other words, they did not compromise with Gentile ways. Though he was born in Tarsus and his family was in Tarsus, they were not Hellenist. They were Jews. They spoke in the house. They would have spoken Hebrew or Aramaic. Certainly he knew Greek. It was the trade language. If you interacted with anybody outside your house, you almost had to know Koine Greek. But in his home, he would have spoken Hebrew and or Aramaic. The most probable explanation is that Paul's father or his grandfather or perhaps even his great-grandfather had rendered some outstanding service to the Roman cause and that resulted in citizenship. Because we know Paul says, I did not buy my citizenship, I was born a citizen. So something his dad or his granddad or his great-grandfather did something 
And Rome responded with granting them citizenship. And citizens of Rome would constitute a social elite. So Paul was not poor. He had connections. He, and he did not suffer the lack of food or clothes or the amenities of life as they were in that day. He was among the social elite. His citizenship was his ticket out of two uncomfortable spots in his life. The first, after he took a beating in Philippi, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 37, he appealed to, they were going to release them, and then Paul said, no, you're not going to release us, I'm a Roman citizen. Well, that threw everybody in, in, in a tizzy. And the second time that he appealed to his Roman citizenship was to keep himself from receiving a beating in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 22 and verse 26. So wherever he went throughout the Roman Empire, a Roman citizen was entitled to all the rights and the privileges which Roman law provided and all the Roman civic duties was re- he was responsible for as well. So in God's providence, he chose a man who had the ability to travel. Think of it this way. He had the ability to go Roman citizens had that privilege, had that, that, those passports. They had passports. He could go anywhere being a Roman citizen. There was no hindrance on where he could go. So in God's wisdom, he chose this man, Saul, who not only knew the languages, not only had the connections with Jerusalem, not only had the temperament and the personality to do what he needed to do, but he had... He had the passport to go wherever the Lord would have him to go. Travel, as far as getting in and out of places, was not an issue for him, as it is with many missionaries today that we work with. Getting in and out of countries is sometimes an issue. It was not for the Apostle Paul. All of this God has done in his wisdom. And so he's headed toward Damascus, and we know what he's going to do. But you've also heard of some passages in Proverbs, and I'm thinking specifically of chapter 16 and verse 9. Do you remember that one? The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Have you ever encountered something like that in your own life where God calls you to do a 90-degree left turn? I'm heading 360, I gotta go 270. That's the way the Lord wants. I'm heading this way, I've gotta go 90. This is exactly what the Lord God did. Proverbs 19 and verse 21 as well. Perhaps more appropriate, many plans are in a man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. Think about that. Though his intention was to persecute, many intentions, many plans are in man's heart, but the counsel of the Lord will stand. God was only going to allow Saul to do what he allowed him to do, what he willed him to do, and nothing more and nothing less. Saul is a textbook illustration of those Proverbs. Saul had a plan. God had a very different plan for Saul. Man's intention, God's prevention. Man's proposition, God's opposition. Think of it that way. Grace is able to reach the chief of sinners. No one is beyond God's saving grace. No amount of sin can stop God's will to save. What I want you to walk away with is that after we finish these 19 verses in a couple of weeks. Walk away with that. Grace is able to reach the chief of sinners. Paul regarded himself as the chief of sinners. No one is beyond God's saving grace. This is a murderer. Well, he never committed abortion. Abortion is murder. Paul was a murderer. He just didn't murder in that way. Here's a murderer. Here's a man bent with everything, every fiber in him to persecute, believing with every fiber in him that he is doing the will of God. Until something happens in that explosion, slow motion, and then all of a sudden, it comes back and it's very different and the man is not the same. That's the gospel. That's the grace of God. 
Walk away with that. This is what God does. This is his work. That is the power of God unto salvation to turn people upside down, reorient them completely. They've been basing their whole life thinking they were going true north and they were heading way, way south, southwest. And they didn't even know it. So God reoriented them. No amount of sin can stop God's will to save. So let's look at the first two verses this morning in Saul's expedition to Damascus. If we noted earlier, chapter 8 ends, Philip disappears, and with uh, similar abruptness, Saul appears back on the scene. So it says in verse 40, Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Now Saul, still breathing threats. Here we have a very different contrast here. Now does not mean after Philip's ministry in Samaria, then Saul began persecuting the church again. It's not what the now means. And we can see that in the word still. Notice what the text says. Saul, Saul still breathing. In other words, when he started on that day, when Stephen was murdered, he is still breathing out threat and murder. So think of it, uh, think of it this way. We should understand the transition between chapters 8 and 9 like this. Now, meanwhile, or in the meantime, Saul still breathing. And the word breathing is a present tense. Still going at it. Presently going at it. So while Philip has been preaching in Samaria, and people have been believing remarkable ministry. Saul has been in the vicinity of Jerusalem in the area, persecuting the believers there. There's clearly a contrast between what was happening in Samaria and Saul's rampage. Some translations reflect that, and they'll they'll use the con, the a stronger conjunction, uh, but. You may have but sometimes in your translations. But Saul, while Philip was ministering in Samaria, is still breathing out threat and murders. That's the transition. Saul was a driven man when he was convinced of a cause. His testimony of his own motive, his own testimony of his own motive and his actions are alarming. They are alarming. This, this man, listen, I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it, is his own testimony in Galatians 1.13. Some of the politicians are actually getting that bold today. I persecuted this way, there you have the way again, that's, that statement referring to the church. I persecuted this way to the death, he says, to the death, the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify of that. Acts chapter 22, verses 4 and 5. This is his own testimony. And others knew it. And fellow believers, after he was saved, fellow believers would say of Saul, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. That's Galatians 1.23. This man was driven. He was convinced of this and he was driven. You see the phrase breathing threat and murder. It reflects Saul's highly hostile attitude toward believers. Saul went to the high priest to obtain permission. Why did he do this? Well, first of all, Note the access to the high priest and the implicit trust that the Sanhedrin showed towards Saul. They must have been in cahoots with one another. They must have trusted one another. Saul was a Pharisee. Was he a part of the Sanhedrin? We do not know. But you note the access to the high priest and the implicit trust that they had with one another. But why did he go to obtain permission? Why did he go to get letters? Well, the Roman government had given the Jewish council authority over the Jews living in foreign cities. And the high priest was the head of the Jewish council. 
So it had, administratively, it, it was possible to actually go out of the area of Judea, out of the area even of Galilee, and bring Jews back who were participating in, and perhaps formerly attended synagogues. Because they were perceived as apostates. So this is what the Roman government had granted the, the, the Jewish council to do. The letters that Paul asked for concerned the right of extradition. Uh, again, he was not an executioner. He was an arresting officer. But Acts 26.10 says, quote, when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them in Acts 26.10. Were the letters written to the synagogues or to the city magistrate is not clear. Either is possible. Saul considered followers of Jesus Christ to be refugees and he sought to go beyond the frontiers of Judea in an attempt to bring these refugees back to face trial and to face punishment. So from synagogue to synagogue he went, hunting down the refugees and doing his best to make them renounce their faith publicly by declaring Jesus to be accursed, right? Accursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. This is the man Saul. This was a measure of his zeal going from synagogue to synagogue, doing these things. And his reputation preceded him. You see, the turn, you see what Ananias said a little bit later. I've heard that he has permission to come here as well. Lord, are you sure you got the right guy? Listen to his own testimony. Again, Acts 26, 11. I punished them often in all the synagogues. I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. There it is. And we see him doing that very thing right here in Acts chapter 9. He was not of the same mind, the same the same piece of advice as his mentor Gamaliel remember Gamaliel back in chapter 5 earlier he recommended patience and moderation remember he said look if this is a work of God you're going to be found to be fighting against God and you're not going to win if it's not the work of God it will work itself out so exercise patience well that's over Saul does not share that same piece of wisdom that his mentor did perhaps Perhaps even Gamaliel at this point had changed in light of what, what Stephen did. So Saul is going to Damascus. Here we go, boys, pack it up. He's not going by himself. There were other men that were going with him. He's a Pharisee. He has letters from the high priest. He has a, a small entourage with him. So he's going to Damascus. And Luke has not told us anything about the church there. This is the first we hear that there is any believers in Damascus. And we do not know how Christianity spread north to Samaria. Excuse me. We do know how Christianity spread to north to Samaria. And we do know that it has spread west to the coastline, Mediterranean coastline. And now going to Damascus and knowing that Ananias is there, now we find out that Christianity has spread north and east to, into Syria, into a city called Damascus. And by the way, Damascus is the first city outside of the land of Israel to be noted as having Christians. You see, we've come quite a ways from Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Four to five years later, Christianity has spread to the surrounding regions. And did you know, why Damascus? There's always a reason, if you think about it, if you start looking at the geography and the, the customs of the day, you'll find a reason why Philippi was so important and you'll find a reason why Damascus was so important. And the reason is, is it was on a major highway that connected, that connected the east from the west. It's a, it's a commercial center. 
uh, halfway, or excuse me, on the way between Mesopotamia and Egypt. That's its importance. And did you know that Damascus is probably the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world? Do you remember a man by the name of Eliezer of Damascus? Remember that phrase when you were reading Genesis? Eliezer of Damascus. Abraham says, no, may Eliezer of Damascus be my heir. God says, no, but an heir will come from you, from your very person, not someone from the outside. Not Eliezer of Damascus, the same Damascus that we see here. So it's mentioned in Abraham's day in Genesis 14. And at one point, Eliezer of Damascus was the heir of Abraham's house according to chapter 15 and verse 2. So it was a commercial center. It's old. It was a commercial center between Egypt and Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia. There was a large Jewish population there. Now there were many synagogues. Hence, it's continual population, its importance, why they would go to Damascus. They go to Damascus as a jumping off point to spread the gospel. That's the reason why Corinth, why? Because it has a port. Philippi, on the Ignatian Way, connects the north and the south. There are reasons why Paul landed in the places that he did, to disperse the gospel, to get it out quickly. It says he's going to, he's going to get letters, he attained letters, so that if any, be fa- any belonging to the way, both men and women, the way there was a, an early name for the church. First Baptist did not exist yet. So it was called the way. They were first called Christians in Antioch. Later that's coming in the later chapters. What's the origin of the way? Possibly Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3 where he's talking about preparing the way. It uses that phrase. But more likely it's from our Lord's words recorded in John fourteen six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this name, the way, is mentioned four times in the book of Acts. In chapter 19, twice. In chapter 24, twice. Four other times besides here. Saul was heartless. I mean, if there's a man who was heartless, he was heartless. And Luke mentions, if Saul found any, you notice that term? Any. If I find any belonging to the way, men or women, doesn't matter, anyone belonging to this movement, he did not care if parents were taken from their children. Perhaps he, perhaps he justified his zeal by pointing to Phineas, who out of zeal for the Lord killed the Israelite man and the Moabite woman whom he took into his tent in Numbers chapter 25. Perhaps that's what he saw himself in the tradition of those that are zealous for the Lord, such as Phineas, such as certain men throughout the Old Testament that would take the spear and go and do the work of the Lord. Perhaps he saw himself in that vein. His hatred was such that has there ever been a man, has there ever been a person so mistaken about such a grave matter? So mistaken about such a grave matter. When I asked that question, I thought of Bloody Mary. Perhaps someone like Bloody Mary, Queen Mary, that murdered many of the Protestants. Bloody Mary came to my mind. The ideology, the ideology of communism came to mind. I've read testimonies of people that were in prison under Nazi, under the Nazi regime. And then they were again prisoner under communism and they said communism was much worse. There was just, there was just, there was just nothing with communism. There was just, it was just Brutality. God's promises and purposes will not be stopped by this madman. They will not. Remember Proverbs? Remember what it says in Proverbs? The mind of man plans his way, 
but the, the plan of the Lord will not be stopped. God's promises and purposes will not be stopped by this madman, Saul of Tarsus. The gates of hell will not prevail. The church cannot be extinguished. Though he gives great effort in his attempt, it will not be extinguished. God is sovereign and he will reveal his sovereignty by using Saul to further the gospel. First, how he does it in his wisdom, twice. He does it in two ways. First, he uses Saul to scatter the saints all over the place. He uses him as his instrument to disperse many believers, to go into other areas. And then, by acquisition. First, by his opposition, and then by acquisition. Saul will himself proclaim this gospel in places further than he has been the instrument in scattering them thus far. All of this in the wisdom, the infinite plan of Almighty God. And you are not outside of that plan. God has saved you. God is preparing you as you sit here today for what? You tell me. What is God preparing you for? Just to work and make money and then die? No. Guess again. Take another shot. What? What's he preparing you for? Well, I have to work. Yes, that's the means to an end, not the end. Work so that you can provide. Work that you, so that you can go. Work that, so that you have resources to do. What? Work so that you can share the test of gospel with people there. What is God preparing you to do? He's going to, this Saul is going to meet Jesus on the road to Damascus. It's going to be sudden. The text says suddenly, that is immediately or unexpectedly. How so? The same word is used in Luke chapter 2 and verse 13. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Suddenly, completely unexpected, immediately, suddenly, unexpectedly, there it was. And it knocked him, knocked him down. Beloved, the Lord is preparing you. Make, don't make that mistake of thinking, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You may not know what you're supposed to do, but I'm telling you, the Lord is preparing you for something. All of you are precious in his sight. All of you have been saved by his grace. All of you are in his hands. All of you have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. All of you have his word. All of you are prepared or being prepared for something. Get on your knees. Search the Lord. Ask him to reveal. Put on your heart what he desires for you to do. And as a church... We will do our best to facilitate that, to aid you, to encourage you, to help you, to do all that we can to make that happen in your life. To be there. But you've got to know what it is first.